from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming up today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch will offer this week's cattle market commentary. She'll look back at the bullishness in last week's cash and futures markets and talk about the potential for additional strength in those trades. Also today, K-State's A.J. Tarpoff discussing the components of a preconditioning program for calves to be weaned this fall. He'll focus on vaccine selection and internal parasite control, among other things. Later on on this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman is joined by K-State's Shannon Rogge as she'll provide an update on the 4-H shooting sports program. All that and more right here on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks once more for being along with us for Agriculture Today. The cattle market commentary is our first item of interest with Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, which is a service co-sponsored by K-State and other land-grant universities, as you well know. Caitlin, before we talk about uh, the LMIC's latest calculations on cattle feeding returns and some other market developments, if you would remark on what by any descriptive would be called an upbeat week in the cash fed and feeder cattle markets this past week. It, It was really good to see. Well, we'll start with fed cattle, which at the end of last week traded over 104 per hundredweight for steers on a live hundredweight basis, which is a really impressive gain from the prior week average of 101. Now, the big question in cattle country is, are these gains sustainable? And I think after a volatile year, it's important to understand that uncertainty regarding it. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I'd say on the fed cattle side is that the industry sense seems to be that backed up cattle supplies have been significantly cleaned up over the last couple weeks. And the futures are still ahead of the cash, trading at 107 per hundredweight on Friday for the August contract, and that's still only two weeks till expiration. I think there's a couple scenarios when we look at in the short term. We are still ahead of the Labor Day holiday, but the question is, are all the backed up cattle cleaned up? And that means fed cattle supplies will remain rather tight, and which would be increasingly supportive of prices, or are we still working through some of the some of the backed up cattle, but the volume isn't nearly as large as anticipated, and maybe the amount of very heavy cattle are not quite as large, and that we are seeing some more short-term supply features at work. This could still mean the third quarter was relatively volatile and could bounce around a little bit for fed cattle prices, but generally speaking, we expect the trend to be up moving through the fourth quarter. But I think there's, there's a couple scenarios that could still play out there. Now, box beef has also climbed higher. As of Friday, it was about $10 higher than the prior week. That, too, is the question is, is that going to maintain? Is that going to continue to climb? And beef demand, I think, is still very much in question in our COVID-era environment. We've had several stops and starts and opening of restaurants in several areas. And Labor Day is really the last big grilling holiday. And so the big question next would be, what does holiday demand look like moving forward? You mentioned earlier that feeder cattle prices have been really strong as of late, and there does seem to be a lot of optimism in the cattle feeding sector. Feed prices are still expected to be below a year ago, even with some of the damage done by weather events last week. If you look at the board, fed cattle prices are expected to be higher um, in the first and second quarter of next year, and so I think that's all playing into some of these larger predicted placements for July that many analysts are forecasting and some of that optimism for those feeder cattle. Want to backtrack a bit, Caitlin. You raised the question of whether or not the backlog of cattle created by the pandemic has been cleared up. Do you have any inkling as to which way that's going? I think probably it wasn't as big as it maybe initially was thought to be. It does seem like we've worked through it at a fairly 
good rate. I mean, we're still looking at marketing rates below a year ago, likely for July. And some of that is too, let's keep in mind. I mean, we were wondering for a long time whether when we were just going to get to 90% of a year ago on the slaughter levels. And, and we're, we're above 95% in July. And so this might just be the new normal for slaughter capacity and throughput. Saturday kill is still helping that out. I think if we're waiting for that big year-over-year increase, uh, we might not see it, but we are still, if there are quite a few cattle still backed up, it will take us a pretty long while to still work through those. I think the fed cattle prices give some indication that maybe it's not quite that large, but again, I think there's still a lot unknown. Right. Time will tell on all of this. So that's a quick reflection on the trade this past week. LMIC has posted its latest commentary on cattle feeding returns and and uh, looking at the numbers for the month of July. It was a rather bleak report there. Well, Eric, I'll read my normal caveats. So the Livestock Marketing Information Center, we calculate these on a base of a set of assumptions. And so it's assuming we're feeding a 750-pound steer in the Southern Plains, and it's it's all cash costs. It's Nothing is assumed to be hedge or normal conditions. So if you think back to this year, normal is not the word you would have used. So it's really more of a barometer. And so when we look at what our model kicks out for July, we have likely – one of the worst returns of the year so far. So we estimated it to be down $200 a head for cattle marketed in July. And again, that's on a what you would consider a normal kind of days on feed. Um, and so losses could have been actually a lot bigger than that be based on longer days on feed that we were that we were talking about during that time. Now, when we look further out, we're still expecting August and September to be probably negative. August might be a little bit worse, and then September is probably going to be closer to zero. That's that's what we're projecting at this point. Um, but we are expecting cattle feeding returns to get better in the fourth quarter, and some of that is because of a lower break-even, and the futures board is showing fed cattle prices above there. And so that's all very promising for those cattle feeding businesses. So it will hopefully, before the year is out, be headed in the right direction once again. But by keeping a wary eye at the same time on those corn prices, as you mentioned, some doubts there about the volume of corn this harvest because of the the derecho damage to the crop and so forth? Yes, the derecho effects, I mean, we're just starting to see estimates. I think when it first came out, I saw as high as 10 million acres, and so that's that harvested acre number might come down. But the estimates are still wide around how much damage there is and what the reduction really will be in the total U.S. corn crop. And the reason for that is that, you know, some of the corn got snapped right off. Other parts of it just got laid down. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seems pretty variable across the state. And so we are expecting a reduction in harvested acres from where we were. But that number is still largely unknown at this point. It's still projected, though, that the corn crop is going to be fairly large and that prices would still be below a year ago um, at this point in time. Again, that will be spelled out in the weeks ahead as the USDA, other crop observers, get a better handle on the damage done in the Corn Belt last week. Some other industry notes of interest to the market, cow liquidation, both on the beef and dairy sides, and the current trends in place. You might let us know about those, Caitlin. So we don't think that there's any significant liquidation going on in the beef herd right now, even though beef cow slaughter year to date is up 3% over last year. The feeder and calf prices have been better than expected through for through a lot of the summer, and a lot of producers are probably in this wait and see pattern. Now, there are going to be some culling decisions made based on breeding outcomes here in the next couple of months, and so you could see relatively high volumes continue. But on January 1, we're not, at this point anyway, predicting a huge uh, decline in that beef cow herd. Now, the other thing that might be affecting those is that cull cow values are well above a year ago. So nationally, last week, they were 11% higher than last year. And so that could, too, potentially be influencing some of those decisions. Now, the drought monitor suggests uh, widespread drought in the western U.S., um, but so far we haven't seen mandatory liquidation of some of those herds based on that. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look to the dairy cow side, dairy cow slaughter is 4% below a year ago, year to date. And dairy prices have had just a roller coaster of a year. And that's expected to continue with the uncertainty around regarding school openings, how many of those kids will be in school, how often, 
all of that is still very up in the air and a big driver of what fluid milk prices and sales are doing. On the other hand, we have away from home consumption, which is still struggling, similar to beef, with you know restaurants starting and stopping and opening and folks having to consume still a large proportion of their meals at home. And so that's going to contribute to the volatility of milk prices, particularly when you talk about cheese and butter. Now, LMIC is predicting the dairy herd to remain steady to probably slightly smaller in 2021. And the decrease in dairy cow slaughter, too, could be contributing to those rise in cold cow values over the last couple of weeks. Caitlin, before we let you go, bullish momentum, very well entrenched in the markets this past week. Will we see that persist into this new trading week? Well, I'd like to say let all we can do is let's hope, but that's not a way to manage a business is on hope, right? <laughs> right? You're always hoping for a better distinction than that. I do think there seems to be some life in this fed cattle market. You know, whether we just go up from here continuously, I think is too optimistic. Um, I think we'll probably see prices bounce around a little bit more in the next month or so. But I think in general, we've probably locked in the lows already for this year. From here, I, I expect fed cattle supplies to continue to tighten. We had significantly below year ago placements in the second quarter, and all of those things are going to start to have a cumulative effect on on these prices. So even if it takes us a little longer to work through the backlog of cattle, this fourth quarter um, could potentially have some some legs to it. Let's hope that uh, things continue to align in that fashion in favor of our cattle producers out there. Caitlin, as always. Thanks for your insight and your comments. We'll touch base once again in a few weeks. Thank you. Caitlin McCulloch from the Livestock Marketing Information Center. She directs that center out of Denver, and she's one of those contributing regularly to our cattle market segment here on Agriculture Today. By the way, check out the center's website for loads of good information on cattle market trends and more. LMIC.info. That's LMIC.info. And we'll be back after this break. This is the K State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, cattle producers, some thoughts on preconditioning those springborn calves for marketing this fall or otherwise. Preconditioning, a commonly used practice, and it needs to be planned out appropriately. That's from our guest now, A.J. Tarpoff, Mike side. He's a beef veterinarian with K-State Research and Extension. Back to how widely used preconditioning is out there. This is a, a management approach that's really caught on in the last 10 years or so, isn't it, A.J.? It really has. And, you know, the word precondition, it's it's used in a lot of different terminologies. But in reality, preconditioning means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, verified preconditioning programs for marketing come up. You know, we, we there's a lot of discussion on those. But when we get down at truly what preconditioning means is we're trying to prepare these calves for the next stage of production. We're just better preparing these animals by managing stress, managing the immune system to get them better prepared for the next stage of production. And that we're trying to create more value added calves. Okay, whether we're keeping and retaining them or we're trying to sell them for some type of added value. And a lot of people have really caught on to this. We will not get into the weeds of the economics, but there have been multiple studies out there that indicate the added market value of a preconditioned calf is very clear. Or if, as you say, retaining the calf for later on, likewise. Uh, There is. There is. And especially at different preconditioning periods uh, often incorporate weaning. Okay, so weaning, the most stressful time in an animal's life, Uh, especially if we're going to be keeping those animals post weaning, we're going to be putting them on a steady plane of nutrition. When we think about precondition, uh, we we often forget about the added value of gain. 
Uh, when we get these animals to consuming feed, they actually they're extremely efficient, and the vast majority of the the return on investment is not necessarily from product utilization from animal health products like vaccines, but it's actually from the weight gain post weaning uh, that we can actually put weight on these calves. But your point that you're stressing today is more toward the planning for a preconditioning program out there, and there are multiple components, one of which would be the health factor. It would be. So when we think about modifying the immune system, right, we're trying to better prepare this animal's immune system for possible things that can threaten it in the future. So what's the number one thing that we go to? Well, and that's vaccines, right? Uh, So vaccines, what are the common products that are utilized during preconditioning programs for calves? Okay, this pre-weaning time. It's usually we're trying to uh, get a pre-wean vaccine. You hear that a lot and you'll see it in media. Uh, That pre-wean vaccine is about three to four weeks prior to weaning. And think of vaccines as a challenge of the immune system. We challenge the immune system. They respond to it in a very low-stress environment, and they mount a good protective response to it. So we do it about a month prior to weaning. That takes planning. We are protecting against uh, things that cause respiratory disease in beef cattle. Okay, so a lot of our viral pathogens. Uh, so you'll see five ways, right? Okay. Those are some of the most common products that we'll see. So our respiratory five ways. If you are in verified preconditioning programs, many of them will require use of a modified live viral vaccine. So that modified live, just keep in mind that we need to be pretty careful on, on the care and handling of those modified live viral vaccines, uh, making sure they don't get too hot. We need to keep them out of the sunlight, making sure we don't freeze them uh, because that is a live virus and that's that's how it interacts with the body. Another common vaccine product that we'll utilize is, you know, traditionally we always refer to as a black leg, mm-hmm. our multivalent clostridial vaccines. Uh, these can be seven ways, eight ways, nine ways. We vaccinate against these diseases because the spores or the bacteria cells actually live in the soil. OK, so they're common in different areas, but we vaccinate and it's a very effective vaccine. So those are the vaccine products that we typically utilize, okay, respiratory and clostridial. Uh, We may use some bacterial products against uh, pneumonia as well. But past that, this is also a prime time that we can uh, take care of some of our parasite issues. Flies are still around, aren't they? Flies and also internal parasites. So late summer, early fall, we can still have quite a few stable flies and horn flies. So we may utilize some products that can combat external parasites. And then internal parasites. These are our dewormers. And so that's the product utilization. But if we're going to be using products, we're going to be running animals through the chute, always be prepared. If we're going to be running calves through, we have a closer, we can get a closer eye on them. Guess what? It's, it's not uncommon that we may find the stray pink eye or foot rot. So making sure that we have the medication handy, that if we need to ad- administer any antibiotics uh, for these uh, particular conditions, we have that available. So, AJ, do we find much difference in parasite control products uh, and as far as efficacy? Is that something that producers need to think about as they secure their supplies? It is something to keep in mind. Use of generics. You know, there's uh, numerous studies that are available out there that actually show some of the generic internal parasite control uh, products may not stack up against the, the trade name or the original. Okay, so that it's kind of a fair warning. I know there's a lot of utilization of generics out there. Uh, They're cheap. They're readily available. uh, But the efficacy may not always be there, depending on the brand. I think the initial discussion is with your local veterinarian. Uh, We talked about vaccines, parasiticides, anything that may have to be uh, given or administered to those calves. Go have a good conversation with your local veterinarian. If products need to be ordered in, we need to make sure that they're in stock and ready for you to be able to pick up. Uh, So a couple of weeks prior to any of these preconditioning periods, if you have dates in mind, it doesn't hurt to go talk to your veterinarian now, making sure that you'll have availability of all those products. Okay, so we, we don't want you to stop by at 4.30 uh, Friday afternoon and expect to get all the product that you need to do it, you know, use it Saturday morning. Uh, you know, a lot of veterinarians have that on hand, but just to be safe, it's, it's a lot better for logistics to plan ahead for all that. Right along that same line, are your working facilities ready to go? We all presume the chute is an operational state may or may not be so. (laughs) We need to be realistic with ourselves. Uh, Chances are the vast majority of our producers haven't necessarily looked at their working facilities since last spring. Okay, so they've kind of sat vacant for the last several months, which is okay. But what do our holding pens, what do our working facilities, what do they look like right now? Uh, 
chances are we've got quite a few weeds and I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit more kosher than dirt in them right now, right? So now is the time to get things cleared out. You know, get rid of the weed cover, making sure that uh, we can increase uh, wind blowing through, especially if it's going to be a hot day. We can clear out all those weeds. It can also take care of some of the fly populations in that working facility to help cattle flow much easier. So they can see they're not going to be burdened by parasites and they can flow through that system. This is also the prime time to kind of check all the little fine tunes of your working facility, hinges, gates, latches, making sure everything's actually functional. Don't be afraid to pull out the WD-40 to get some things lubed back up, right? And on top of that, the, the shoot or the restraining system itself. Go through all the individual pieces and parts. Is there anything that need, needs replaced? Uh, you know, do you have different areas that do need to be re-welded? Check the floor to make sure that we're not going to be causing any, any damage to hoof walls or anything like that as cattle go through the chute. If you're a producer that uh, uses uh, load cells and actually takes individual weights on cattle, making sure those load cells are actually functioning like they should or do any tweaking or replacing it if necessary before the cattle start running across. Because you don't want to deal with any of that while you're working cattle. That just hangs everything up. But also on the facility side of things, you would suggest that producers think about the accommodations for those calves post-preconditioning, after they're worked. Right. So many time with these pre-weaning shots, you know, we, we separate the cows and the calves. We work the calves. We may or may not have to do anything with the cows. But again, we're working all of them. We've separated them. Usually we pair them back up. But we have to keep our time frame in mind. Is there enough time in the day that you're going to send all those animals back into the pasture? And especially if you're going to have to be putting them on a trailer and, and taking them any type of distance, do you have enough time or daylight in that given day. Uh, many times it's not. And we may hold those animals in, in a small pasture, paddock, or pen space just overnight. Well, instead of scrambling at the end of the day to get water and feed ready for those animals, be prepared uh, ahead of time. If you have an automatic water in that working facility, making sure that it's clean, it's, it's, it's working, and you, know, you don't have to do any tweaks late in that afternoon after you've already worked all day. Mm -hmm. And also have some feed on hand. Whether it's bales of hay, whether you're going to be providing a ration, making sure that you, you had that lined out where it's, it's an easy chore right at the end of the day where it's readily available and it's easy to do. And even if there isn't a daylight issue, it might be producer preference to just keep those cows and calves overnight to observe any issues that might arise. Absolutely. And that's where being prepared, having the feed, the water, everything prepared. We have a nice area for those animals to stay overnight. It's a good idea to plan ahead so we're not scrambling at the end of the time. But we'll roll it back around to something you said earlier, AJ, in closing, and that is work with your veterinarian, tailor a preconditioning program that suits your herd needs. It's the most critically important aspect of an entire preconditioning program. Work with your local veterinarian. You can discuss your concerns, issues in the past. If there's anything that you need to tweak or change, now is the time to be able to have that conversation to tailor made some of these programs for your, your individual operation. You know, going through all these logistical decisions ahead of time really decreases the stress and really takes away some of that burden when we go to precondition and where we, where we go to work calves. There really is value in work ahead on preconditioning those springborn calves pre-weaning. AJ, good input. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. And that's from beef veterinarian AJ Tarpoff, K-State Research and Extension. Now we'll step aside once again for a few minutes and when we return we'll have for you today's agricultural news headlines and once more Jeff Wickman awaits with this week's 4-H segment for you. So stay with us. This is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is the K-State Radio Network, and you're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTN. 
Grain storage facilities and handling equipment did take a beating from that freak storm which ripped a path through the Corn Belt a week ago today. The violent weather event started in southeastern South Dakota and northeastern Nebraska last Monday morning, gaining strength as it cut that destructive swath through the middle one-third of Iowa and then continued into Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. The derecho storm lasting 14 hours, traveling 770 miles. All of the states affected lost grain bins and equipment, but Iowa was hit particularly hard. The Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship estimates that hundreds of millions of bushels of commercial grain storage and tens of millions of bushels of on-farm storage were lost in that state due to the storm. Now, just for context, in 2019, Iowa's grain storage capacity was 2.1 billion bushels on farm and 1.5 billion bushels off farm, according to the USDA. Now, with harvest a little over a month away, producers and elevator officials are now scrambling to replace at least some of the bins and find alternative storage options. Grain bin and equipment manufacturers, builders, and elevator officials say they will do everything they can to get grain facilities operational before the combines roll. But there's just not enough time and workers and bin materials in stock to replace every bin that was destroyed by harvest. Builders say that some will get rebuilt built, but more grain bunkers and storage bags will be used to store this year's crop. Following up, a field agronomist with Iowa State Extension and Outreach, Megan Anderson, toured several counties in central Iowa late last week, saying the damage is really remarkable. She said that nearly every acre of corn is affected in some way or the another, and much of the corn is flat on the ground. Some is pinched below the ear and above the ear. She called it dramatic and variable from one field to another. Soybean fields, she says, seem to have fared better than corn. Corn, on the other hand, pushed over and leaning other stands are hailed out and an extension cropping system specialist at iowa state mark licht said that bean fields near his home already have started to stand back up but it's a different story for corn he says corn not as lucky in its ability to recover if corn plants are in the early dense stages corn recovery would be very minimal anything horizontal he said will stay as it is now And how to harvest that downed corn will be stressful. In the coming weeks, producers will need to decide whether to feed that green out of the field or make decent silage. And he added that the potential losses are still uncertain. That 2009 hailstorm in Iowa was a good reference, he says, to determining how much yield may be lost. He said corn was at about the same stage back in 2009 as it is today. And that crop then in the damaged areas yielded from 100 to 150 bushels per acre. And one other factor to consider, according to Licht, was the potential for crop diseases developing in those flattened fields. In particular, he said he'll be on the lookout for stock rot and ear molds. U.S. wheat faces some market challenges because of ample global supplies, according to a USDA economist. Here's more on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. Even though U.S. wheat growers will likely bring in a crop 4% smaller than this past year, those growers are still likely to see a cut in average prices because... They're driven heavily by international supplies. And USDA's Outlook Board Chairman Mark Chekanowski told us world wheat supplies are likely to be about 2% larger this year than last. This is a smaller rate of growth than had been projected a month ago. But... Certainly, the market has been under some pressure for some time just because the the larger supplies coming out of Russia and Ukraine have been uh, weighing on prices a bit. Even with the cut in production that we made this month at the global level, Supplies are still very abundant. And so USDA has cut its all-wheat price forecast. Originally, the average price was expected to be four sixty a bushel, which would have been two cents higher than this past marketing year. But the new projected wheat price, four fifty, is eight cents less than this past year. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. To the agricultural calendar and reminding you of that second and final. Kansas Livestock Association, K-State 
Ranch Management Field Day. It is set for tomorrow, August the 18th, near Uniontown. It'll include a panel discussion on the utilization of cover crop grazing systems, an outlook on the markets and the factors affecting them, optimizing cow herd efficiency, and combating agricultural stress. The event will be hosted at G3 Cattle Company, owned by the George family there near Uniontown, and the event held in honor of Daryl George. K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney and Jared Pollock and Gail George, both of G3 Cattle Company, will discuss the management considerations of utilizing annual forages as a grazing source, how to implement and incorporate those systems. From CoBank, Tanner Emke will be talking about market trends and providing an outlook based on his team's research. And K-State's Bob Weber will be aboard on the program tomorrow. Bob will discuss what criteria to consider when determining an ideal mature cow weight. Lastly, from the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Kelsey Olson will be highlighting resources to assist producers in managing stress, financial, and legal challenges, and more. This field day begins with registration at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and it'll include a free beef dinner at 645. This event is set up to accommodate social distancing protocol. There will be masks available, hand sanitizer provided to each attendee. Once more, it is the K-State KLA Ranch Management Field Day coming up tomorrow at G3 Cattle Company near Uniontown in southeast Kansas. Hope you can attend. For more information and directions, go to kla.org. That's kla.org. And K-State's research centers in western Kansas will be hosting a pair of virtual fall field days. These will be set for next week and specifically next Wednesday and Thursday, August the 26th and 27th. The Agricultural Research Center at Hayes will host its virtual event from noon to 1.30 on August the 26th, covering many topics including new herbicide-tolerant crop traits and weed control strategies for western Kansas, the role of temperature and insect population dynamics, and more. That'll be on the 26th next Wednesday from noon to 1.30. And then K-State Southwest Research and Extension Center's virtual fall field day on August the 27th, the next day, noon to 1.30, alfalfa and corn insect management and dry land cover crop research, among other topics to be covered there. You can find out more by going to the websites of either the Agricultural Research Center at Hayes or the Southwest Research and Extension Center. This is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. The state coordinator for Kansas 4-H Shooting Sports says the program is on target to host state contests in several disciplines this fall. However, Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist Shannon Rogge says the state matches, because of COVID-19 restrictions, are going to look a little different this year. Shannon, as the program coordinator for Kansas 4-H Shooting Sports, you're in the middle right now of doing qualifying matches. There are a number of matches still coming up this month. Yeah, so we have had, for the last couple of weeks, they have had qualifiers across the state, and then the majority of qualifiers will still happen in the shooting sports program the last two weekends of August. And these qualifiers are state qualifying, so the youth have to attend these qualifiers and receive a certain score in whatever discipline that they are shooting in. And then that enables them to potentially have the option to go to a state match. The shooting sports program is kind of split in Kansas into spring disciplines and fall disciplines. Fall disciplines include archery and shotgun, which are our two biggest. Also, we do small bore pistol and rifle and then muzzle loading hunting skills for qualifiers. Talk a little bit more about what they learn once they get involved in this project area. So it is very structured because of the increased 
safety with the youth. So they learn not only how to appropriately handle the firearm and archery equipment and bows, but they also, in that process, they learn a lot about self-discipline and goal setting, being able to have a goal in mind of a score that they want and then the steps that they need to take to accomplish that. But along that way, they really have to be able to aim well. They have to have a lot of self-discipline on how they hold their body, how they hold the equipment. So there's a lot of life skills that go into that. And then, the, like I said, the, the actual shooting or the bow is the fun part. But the instructors are very good about everything that leads up to that point. Yeah, they actually do a lot of kind of homework before they even get to the point where they're pulling the bow or shooting the rifle. Yes, they do. Speaking of instructors, that is something that we need more of in 4-H shooting sports. And you've got some trainings that are going to be coming up a little bit later this year. Correct. So we do instructor training at least once a year. We had an instructor training planned for the spring, but because of Everything that happened, that got canceled. So we have rescheduled it for this fall, November 7th and 8th in Cimarron, Kansas at the Gray County Fairgrounds. We have sent out preliminary surveys to kind of gauge interest. We have our statewide instructors that come in and help us teach that. So we do have to make sure that we have interest in those disciplines to kind of help plan that weekend a little bit more. So preliminary survey has been sent out to all the agents and coordinators throughout the state. And that instructor training is two days. We start on Saturday morning and they go through Sunday afternoon. And then through that process, they're learning about some 4-H essential elements in general, but then they really dive deep into discipline training. And at this, even though it's in the fall, I said that our years kind of split between fall and spring seasons. At instructor training, you can get trained in every discipline. There is the option if we have enough interest. So we add air pistol and air rifle back into that, that were the spring discipline. So that is available. Like I said, that's going to be coming up. We're kind of gauging interest. So if, if anyone is interested in that, they need to contact their local office and they can get them set up. We've been working with agents throughout the summer to kind of start making those connections and those networks of what positions they need to fill, uh, especially if they have someone that they know is retiring or no longer going to be in that volunteer position. Shannon, why is it so important for them to get the training? So for shooting sports, we really have the program structured all the way up from nationals is about safety not only the fun aspect of them being able to shoot the firearm or have the bow, but really the safety. And then we can, when they're not safe, they can't learn. So safety first, and then we can do the learning and the fun stuff. For instructor training, they all have to be certified instructors. We do not allow a program to run in the state without a certified instructor that has gone through training. And in this training, they when they really look in there and they study their discipline during that weekend, a lot of the information is about how to work with the youth to be safe on the line. And again, we don't allow anyone in the state to run a program without certified instructors and a certified coordinator that oversees the program. So a coordinator in itself is not, they do not have to teach a discipline. They can get I mean, they can get dual certified if they want, but the coordinator is kind of that program manager and they oversee, they need to know all the rules just like everyone else. And they have to oversee every discipline in their county or district, however they have it set up. So the instructor training is very important for the future of the shooting sports program. That is why we have them every year to really keep renewing that volunteer base and then As we move forward, we're trying to, you know, make that instructor training keep up. We keep up with all the national guidelines that come down from the National Shooting Sports Committee. And we're really keeping that up to date with information that we learn about. 
We mentioned at the beginning that they are doing qualifiers right now for state matches, which are planned for later in the fall, and you're actually still finalizing some of those plans. Correct. State matches are going to look a little different this year. It depends on kind of the location and discipline of how many kids that we normally expect in a year. But with COVID restrictions, we are changing how those will look a little bit. We are doing our very best. I know a lot of things haven't gone as planned this spring and summer, but we are doing our very best to still have those state matches. They will look different. So we are still in the middle of finalizing those plans and getting that information out to the counties and the the coordinators, families. So just be watching for details. Archery match is the last weekend in September, and then we'll move into a small bore hunting skills muzzle loading match and then we'll wrap up with a shotgun match that's state coordinator for kansas 4-h shooting sports shannon rogge again for more information contact your local extension office or visit kansas4h.org and that'll do it for this edition of agriculture today for eric atkinson i'm jeff wickman this is the k-state radio network